the deployment at the present time. Campaign strategist Bruce Hawker and Michael Kroger, president of the Victorian Liberal Party. Uh, Bruce, uh, Tony Abbott, it was right, wasn't he? I mean, it was interesting that if, a couple of days later, Barack Obama has sent in about 50 special forces into he sent, Syria. He sent uh, some uh, ground troops into Syria. Pathetically few, but that yeah, proves Abbott but was it, right. Well, uh, uh, Abbott's got... Yeah, a legacy to protect, I suspect, mm -hmm. here, and I think he's going to continue Just to try to say do that. It, Bruce, I know, I know it's <laughs> hard yeah, as it is. You've got to say he was it. right, surely. Uh, uh, I, I think the whole Syrian issue is very, very complex, mm. and very, very complex, Andrew. Um, you know, there's been four million Syrians displaced internally, three million of them in, in, in Turkey and adjacent uh, nations. It's very, very hard to be too prescriptive about what's happening there is from the Australian going to kill perspective. You They're not to say, is it going to really kill you to say he got it right, unlike what most of the Fairfax and ABC reporters were saying? Well, I'm just saying that it's a, it is complex and different. It would kill you. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, this, Thank this, you, Andrew. <laughs> this, is, this is what amazes me about the, the left's coverage of this, right? He embarrassed Australia. He was wrong. How could he uh, make these prescriptions for Syria from such a distance? Barack Obama goes ahead and proves him right on Syria, at least. Well, Abbott's, Abbott was absolutely right on what he said about all this. I mean, l l let's look at this way, Andrew. ISIS, or IS, is nine years old, right? Nine years old, set, set up in 2006 by Baghdadi I. For seven of those nine years, Barack Obama has been president of the United States. Now, what's happened to IS during those nine years? Have they got stronger or weaker? Stronger. This is squarely at the feet of Obama, who's allowed this organisation, 80% of whose ex time of existence has been under his presidency, he has been hopeless on this issue, absolutely hopeless. Well, it's interesting, you know, Islamic State is claiming credit for having shot down a Russian jet. Yep. Uh, 224 people on board mm. dead. Now, uh, we look, say, uh, it's probably... They would say that, wouldn't they? They would say that, wouldn't they? Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of doubt as to whether they've got that capability, so we'll see. But uh, what did you make, actually... But, but just, just uh, the whole ISIS thing, let's go back to the very beginnings of where the that, that whole Al-Qaeda problem started. It was when George W. Bush invaded Iraq. There was no Al-Qaeda, there was no Islamist movement Pardon? there at that stage. There was not. Al-Qaeda was, was in 2001 was, responsible for the World it, Trade Centre bombing a couple of years before Iraq. It was not in Iraq. It was and, now, every... and now there's a huge war being waged there, Andrew, with, you know... Hundreds of thousands he of people didn't, dying in, as a result. As Tony Blair said... Don't the, put it all no, at the feet no, no, of no. Barack Obama. Mate, as Tony Blair said, we, inv we, the coalition, invaded in Iraq, but we didn't invade in Syria. And we partially helped in Libya. All of those three different examples, still the same result. And at some stage, you've got to admit, it's not the West. It really is something oh, of that culture. No doubt that, you know, that this is a very much a Middle Eastern issue that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And I suspect that oh, right. in our so lifetime, wasn't, we're not going to resolve it. Bush. So it wasn't it, George Bush. George Bush certainly invaded Iraq. <laughs> and as a result of that, Al-Qaeda got a foothold in Iraq. And there have been hundreds of thousands of people dying as a result yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, but they've been there before that. And, of course, Zakawi set up... Um, the Al-Qaeda offshoot in Iraq in 2004 and pledged allegiance to bin Laden in 2004. When he was killed in 2006, Zakawi then turned it into... Uh, sorry, um, Baghdadi then turned it into ISIS. But they have lived there for many, many years, w well before the World Trade Centre in 2001. And, in fact, oh, well, the Islamic State well, headquarters is in Syria, well, just so I remind well, you. But what did you make of Tony Abbott's intervention, Michael, on, on this and on telling Europe to get tough on illegal immigrants? Well, look, um, apart from, you know, the, the typical ratbag left press in Australia, who includes Paul Bongiorno, I must say, Paul's gone completely off the edge these days, <laughs> that terrible article you wrote yesterday in the Saturday. That terrible channel, I mean, Paul, Paul, I'm sorry, please, please, Paul, you've lost all sense of objectivity. Uh, Abbott May gave an excellent speech. Uh, he warned Europe. I mean, he's a man in a position to make these judgments, to make these calls, given the fact that his policies in Australia have saved hundreds and hundreds of lives, you know, the, the extension of the old Howard policy which has saved lives um, from people drowning in, in, uh, across the seas. Look, the answer to the, is this. The Gulf states should be taking these refugees. They could easily take two or three four or four million refugees, particularly countries like 
Saudi Arabia, which has a massive land... They're not interested. ..and a massive land bank and, and is a very wealthy country. So, um, you know, Abbott was... Abbott was True, but it was interesting. ..to be done, but, you know, but there are Middle Eastern countries which are taking a massive load. They're not including about, taking it. They've just including been Including three million by. around mm. Turkey, Jordan and other adjoining but states. But I'm, I'm interested in Abbott's role here, um, Bruce. It was interesting that Malcolm Turnbull seemed more uncomfortable with the prescriptions and the speech that Abbott gave than has been uncomfortable about anything that Bill Shorten's done. What do you see this... Do you see something in this, a template for Abbott's future role, like being head of the Conservative rump in, within the Liberal Party? I suspect so, and I don't think Turnbull particularly likes it. Um, but, you know, he would see it as Abbott trying to build up his legacy, what he did in his two years as Prime Minister. But uh, I don't think uh, that's going to be very much part of the focus for Malcolm Turnbull in the coming years. Um, the, the issue around boat people was essentially sorted out and continues to be sorted out by them. I think that's a concession that has to be made. And as a result of that, I don't think he wants to focus on that. He wants to focus on his agenda for change, not on the past. All right, well, let's talk about his agenda. I'm still... <coughs> I, I know you're a supporter, but I am still struggling to know what his agenda is. Let's have a look, for example. There's been no talk of spending cuts, just new talk of uh, taxes, a tax hit on super, and, of course, an, a higher GST. Changes to the GST should be part... should be on the table. But the idea that uh, state governments can just... Uh, say we're not going to do anything about making our hospitals more efficient or our mm. schools more efficient. We're just going. We just want to put a hand out for more money. That is. That's that's just Part ridiculous. The the now the reports today in the Sunday Telegraph add into speculation: 15% GST instead of 10 in exchange for tax cuts. But the states do want their share of the cash, so that suggests it's going to be a total tax rise overall. I very much like what he's saying because. Um, you know, it is better to to have a higher GST, even at 15%, if you're going to offset a lot of that with True. tax cuts. Why is that? Because it's better to have pe let people decide, first of all, where they're going to spend their money. Tax consumption rather than income. That's the phil philosophy behind it, as far as I'm concerned. I agree. But if what Turn Malcolm Turnbull is doing is saying, look, there'll be more money for the states, but you have to become more efficient before you get any of this 15%, it's an extra 25 to 30 billion, great. The public hospital system True. in this country is, is on, on, on any study, is very, very inefficient compared to privately run hospitals. So if part of what he's saying to the states is more money for you, but you clear up the hospital system in this, uh, that no, you no, run, no, I, I, I'm fully great. on board, except, of course, if you give the states part of the extra revenue from the GST rise, you won't cut the marginal tax rates by an equivalent amount. So the total tax take increases, which is not what should be happening. Yeah, but look, I was interested true. in this, yeah. uh, Bruce. Have a look. Uh, the next day, Malcolm Turnbull seemed to backpedal. First, it's firmly on the table... And then he says this. As far as the the GST is concerned, that is a that's clearly in the mix, but it's I'm not advocating an increase in it. Is that typical Malcolm Turnbull, where he suggests this thing, but also this thing? I'm not in favour of this, but maybe I am. Yeah, look, you he, read into him what you like. He does tend to walk a line, you know. He's a sort of a social progressive, but a fiscal conservative, and he, he talks the talk, but is he walking the walk yet? We haven't really seen it. But, you know, today's News Limited papers have you know, splashing with a 15% GST with various options. Obviously, that's coming out of government. They're laying the groundwork for it. I think it's going to be problematic for them because, as Golda Meir said, as soon as you have to explain, you've lost. And, and when you start talking about, you know, offsets and so forth, it's fine for us to be discussing that. But for your average punter, it's, I'm going to be paying an extra 50% on what I consume. And a lot of that is just the basics of life. And a very bold move uh, with less than a year to go before the next election. Well, I remember what, John ha John, what happened to John Howard in 1998. Nearly he lost. nearly lost an unlosable election. And that's with a long preparation beforehand. Coming up, more from the panel after this. Alan Finkel was this week appointed our new chief scientist. He's a global warmist, which politicians love, but he had a message that they don't. He says, if you really think coal-fired power is heating the planet, then perhaps go to nuclear instead, because solar and wind power is still too pricey and unreliable. I think that there's no doubt that in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, nuclear is fantastic. It's right up there with solar and wind as a near-zero emissions technology. And 
across the world, nuclear has been used very, very safely. But that's when the politicians went, whoa! Nuclear energy has low emissions, but is hugely expensive to construct and has a number, you know, obviously very big environmental problems associated with it or challenges associated with it. I'm not convinced, and I don't think the economic case has been made. I'm back with Michael Kroger and Bruce Hawker. Um, coal or nuclear, we have to choose, don't we? Well, we do at the minute. If you have nuclear, it's going to be 20 to 30 years before it opens. So um, you doesn't have... need to be if you buy it off the shelf and stop all this ridiculous hyperventilator. No, well, that's true. Unless, you, unless, you, but the proposal I think ultimately is to set up nuclear power plants in Australia, and that's going to take decades if it ever, it ever, if it ever got the green light. But look, this whole notion about coal. I mean, as we know, there are two types of coal. There's, there's coking and thermal, and one's used for um, steel production, and one's used for electricity. Now, if you have no coal. Um, around the world, you are going to... And Josh Friedmerg was absolutely right here the other day, absolutely right. There is a moral case for coal. If you want to have a lot of people in this world with no electricity at all, great, let's not have any coal. But this is a selfish Western view of these people who live in grand luxury in countries, free countries like Australia and America and Britain, condemning third world countries and billions of people to no electricity if you don't have coal. And that is a very <laughs> selfish, we not just Western, not selfish just Western attitude, Absolutely, but it's not just condemning uh, the poor overseas. Uh, coal earns us uh, $40 billion, billion in royalties and, and taxes. It uh, puts 40,000 Australians directly into yeah, jobs. It we, have gas, our power we, have gas, we have gas here as well, but Ridiculous. in a lot of these countries, these people have no electricity at all. But, Bruce, uh, I want you to have a look at this and comment. Um, it is 16 years since um, uh, Pangea, a nuclear waste company, went to the then Howard government and said, how about... Uh, we have a, a, an international nuclear waste dump here. It couldn't even get an appointment with the minister because that's the f you know, fear of seeming pro-nuclear. Now Turnbull is saying, well, maybe he is, <laughs> uh, after talk talking to the chef in a hotel he was staying at, let's have a look at perhaps having the industry have a look. I was just talking about this with the cook in the uh, cafe downstairs. Brett, the, 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 the chef was saying, um, his view is we've got the uranium, we mine it, why don't we process it, turn it into the fuel rods, lease them to people overseas when they're done, bring them back, and we've got stable, very stable geology in remote locations in a stable political environment. Now, I'm a little puzzled. Uh, maybe you can explain, Bruce. Is this Tony Ab uh, uh, Malcolm Turnbull's considered plan, having looked at the evidence, or is it just something that Brett the chef told him over breakfast? Well, of course, Brett the chef is a former Pangea executive. <laughs> Better remember that. <laughs> He's no, he's no ordinary chef. <laughs> well, they, hey, they, they got and when, when he does business. a bomb Alaska, <laughs> <laughs> he means it. Well, Brett the chef sounds to me a very smart guy, but uh, is this, what is this? <laughs> I love this? this. The best story, the man by the way. The no, the best story is Malcolm Turnbull on the train a few months ago on his way to Jason Woods' electorate in Melbourne in La Trobe, and the fellow opposite Turnbull came up and started talking to him. And Malcolm said to this fellow, "What do you do, mate?" And he said, "Oh, nothing." And Malcolm said, "Oh, why? You haven't haven't had a job for a while?" And he said, "No, no, I've just got out of jail. Uh, I was in there for manslaughter." <laughs> um, so Malcolm is a man of the people, as we know. Did Malcolm come out of the train uh, carriage no. with a, a, a penal <laughs> no, no, a penal plan, no, a plan no. for our prisons? He was, he was safe and went into the loving. <laughs> arms of Jason with the member for Latrobe. Look, we can laugh about that, but you know, he is an effective politician. He, he is, does he, is. he does get down you know, onto the street level, and people like that. They so do. we've got to be very, very uh, All right. about now, listen, that reality. Uh, Bill Shorten yesterday said he wanted the voting age uh, lowered from 18 to 16. Have a listen. Young people, including 16 and 17-year-olds, pay tax. They can drive cars. They can serve in the military at the age of 17 they should be able to vote. Well, they can't serve in the military at 16, and uh, they pay virtually no tax, only 17,000 of the nearly half a million. Uh, is this a good idea or not? No, it's not, but if it was a good idea, if Mr Shorten was consistent, I presume, I mean, some enterprising journalist should ask him, are you also proposing to lower the age for gambling and drinking to 16? Because if you're going to say to people at 16, you can decide on the national government, then obviously they're responsible enough to drink and gamble as well. So someone should ask him whether that's also his proposal. Very good point. Is this just a desperate measure because adults won't vote for... Enough adults won't vote for Labor, so you go for people young enough and silly enough to do so? Because <laughs> they, they tend to... When Actually, you're left, age, of course, at, you at, tend to be socialist, at, don't at, you? At the age of 16, most kids, I think, would just vote the way their parents vote. I think they 
they start to think about that issues a little bit later. Uh, no, that is, I think, pretty accurate. No, there's but, actually but, there's been research done to say this would cost the Conservatives 0.2% of their vote. Well, bring it on. <laughs> I think that's his measure. But it's a measure of perhaps his desperation, isn't it? Uh, is, is, is he likely... Labor's got a problem because it's very unpopular mm. and they're now four points behind. Is Bill Shorten safe? No, I, I, I'm not sure Bill Shorten can win the election now. Um, this, this, this love affair with Malcolm Turnbull, is, it's not a honeymoon, it's a permanent relationship. The electorate have known Turnbull for a long time and they like him. They like his modern values. Uh, Shorten is a relic of the 50s and don't forget he's got this Royal Commission finding coming and I don't know what the Commission will find but boy the Court of Public Opinion has convicted this man Shorten of the most terrible terrible behaviour as a union leader. If he was a corporate executive by the way you can imagine what would have happened to him by now. Um, I don't think Shorten's electable now. And I don't think he was electable before well, him. He was, Tony he, Abbott He was in that. front in the polls before but they have to move to Albanese or, or um, or Plebiscic, I think, I think this bloke's finished. Ab Albanese or Plebiscic? I mean, I liked uh, Anthony Albanese, but I'm not sure... And, and uh, Tanya Plebiscic, I don't know, what do you think? Well, I just don't think that they're going to make a move now. I mean, we've already had Rudd being removed by Gillard, Gillard being removed by Rudd. I think it would be pretty awful to have uh, a short and removed by no, 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 Bruce, somebody can else. I do look, a can I do a counterfactual? No, wait a minute, yeah. because you were with mm. uh, Kevin Rudd when he beat Julia Gillard again, mm. and you saved... Ten seats, I reckon. Minimum ten 25, seats. Twenty-five, we say. Well, you say twenty-five. It worked. That's the point. And if uh, Michael is right, changing leaders, changing prime ministers, much more awesome, has also helped the Liberals. Mm -hmm. Why not change Bill Shorten? Well, look, I, as I said, I just don't think that there's the mood inside the party to do that. They would require a 60% vote of the caucus to spill. I think that would be challenging as well. But, look, I, a, a broader point, and I think uh, Michael's touched on it, is... Has Labor really been left behind by a political leader, a Liberal leader, who for the first time in the Liberal Party's history since Menzies is moving his party to the political centre? Might be centre-right, but it's the centre. And you see when... Or the left. When, well, or the left, perhaps. <laughs> but you see when leaders do that, whether it be Hawke, Keating, Blair, Clinton, you know, or the centre-left then they can govern for years and years and years. Yeah. This is the problem that Labor has to confront now, and it's, a lot of it is structural as well. The relationship with the unions being seen to be uh, backward-looking. Bruce, given you're here, and Howard once made that wonderful statement about Lazarus with a triple bypass, could it be time for a third incarnation of Kevin? <laughs> 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 Guys, we'll leave that one to Bruce Hawker. No, no. <laughs> Bruce Hawker, Michael Kroger, thank you so much for your Thanks, time.